my name is Thompson Imasoge. Everyone calls me Tomo. I'm an art director from Houston, Texas. Um, absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. Um, been working in the industry for about a little over two and a half years. Uh, just started here at Mullen Low, October 7th. Uh, so far, it's been a wonderful experience. I'm sure you guys are going to be able to hear a little bit more about it shortly. But uh, definitely, it's been uh, an interesting journey for me transitioning from corporate into advertising. Uh, so I'm definitely glad to be here, glad to share my story. Hi, everyone. My name is Raquel Wilbin. I'm a senior media planner originally from Memphis, Tennessee. Um, and I've been at Media Hub for the past year and a half and been a part of Black at Monlo for that same amount of time. Hi, everyone. My name is Maya Gray. I am originally from Charlotte, North Carolina. I, woo, <laughs> I am an assistant account executive in PR, and I've been a part of Mullen Lowe and the industry for about four months. I'm a recent college grad. Yes, college grad. Yeah. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Taylor Brody. I am a senior strategist at Mullen Lowe. Um, I'm from St. Louis, Midwestern gal. Yeah. And um, I have been at Mullen Lowe for about two months, but I've been in the industry for about two years. Happy yeah. to be here. Um, so my name is Kelly Fredrickson. I'm the president of Mullen Lowe, New York and Boston. And I have also been there for about 18 months. And um, one of the first conversations I had with somebody at Mullen Lowe uh, was a black strategist. And I talked to her about why she decided to come to Mullen Lowe, because at the time, she was one of four black people at Mullen Lowe. And um, she said, you know, I really thought about it. And I called my mom. And I said, mom, I don't know if I can do it. I don't know if I can train a whole nother group of white people. And I knew instantly that a big part of my job was to make sure that she did not have to do that alone. Uh, so she, along with Raquel, and two others who had just started about that time kind of found each other, started having lunch together. And from that, created what is now called Black Ant Mullen. And um, there are 31 members, uh, which is great. But, but I don't allow anybody to talk in percentages, because if you think about the percentage change from 4 to 31, that sounds magnificent. But there are 31, and that's not enough, right? So that's why we're here today, because we want to talk to you guys about what they've done. Um, I am their moderator, but all of the questions that they have given me, they have written with you in mind. What do you want to get out of this panel? What do you want to learn and understand? So. I just want to say thank you guys for spending so much time in thinking about what you're going to say today. Um, so let's start with uh, what you think. We'll start with you, Raquel. What do you think the current impact of Black and Mullen is right now at the agency? Yeah, so I, I think you spoke to it a little bit earlier, right? Like the impact has really been the exponential growth. If you think about we started at four to five of us, right? And then now we're at 31, only within less than two years. So it's been amazing to see us not only come in, but also recruit so that we're intentional in bringing those numbers up. And then on top of that, I've seen more of us as we come into the agency, um, think about how we can curate the culture in every single room we're in. So it's been amazing to see people speak up more, for people to be on more accounts. It's really important for us to have a voice, and I've seen a lot more of that since we started. Yeah, and then for me, um, Black and Mullen, its impact so far has been really influential. So this group is actually how I came to find my job at Mullen Low. So I'm a recent graduate of Hampton University. Whoop, whoop. <laughs> <laughs> and so a few members of the group um, actually came to our school on a recruitment trip. And I saw Black and Mullen, I saw young black people advocating for space within their agency and the industry, like unapologetically. And that really spoke volumes to me. And I was like, that's something that I want to be a part of. That's a place I can like see myself making a difference. And I know that Black at Mullen's impact and inspiration has like extended far beyond me. And like like Raquel said, we've really gone, we've gone a lot in terms of like recruiting and getting new faces into the door. Mm -hmm. And Tomo, you know, you recently joined us. Um, you came from Accenture and then you went to ad school and then you were at an agency in Portland and you just recently joined us. So can you talk about sort of the difference between where you were and where you are now? Not for sure. Um, just looking back at my creative journey, um, you know, I've been a part of agencies that were super big, agencies that were super small and super niche in places like Portland, Maine. Uh, but truth be told, honestly, as a black male, I, I never really felt like I had a place in advertising. I never really felt like I had a place in the industry. 
uh, primarily because I felt like there just wasn't any sort of entity that was in the organization that was able to speak and cater to my needs and my concerns. Um, so when I was interviewing with, with Mullen Lowe, uh, one of the things I had the opportunity to do was actually meet Black and Mullen. I got to sit in one of their meetings. And Kelly, when I tell you, the moment I walked in that door and I saw all these black folks, whether they're from creative, strategy, et cetera, just all together, just you know, bonding with each other, sharing their experience. It, it honestly, it hit me like it really did because I've been longing for that sense of community mm -hmm. since the moment I left Accenture. That was part of the reason why I left my corporate job because I didn't feel like I had a place. And just the amount of love that I was able to receive just from opening day, mm -hmm. people checking in on me, um, seeing how I was adapting to Boston, it was deep for me. So uh, Mullen Low definitely, you know, Black and Mullen was definitely the main thing that drove me to come in here because I was interviewing at mad agencies and this was the only agency that I interviewed at that really had a place for me, mm -hmm. so. Um, so I think for me, the most impressive thing about what Black and Mullen has done is that it's not a traditional employee resource group in the way that we think about that. And um, it was created by them and for them. They have no president or you know, no hierarchical structure. Uh, they juggle the roles and the responsibilities amongst each other, but the main rule that they have is the last person in to Black at Mullen welcomes the next black person into the agency. Um, and one thing that they talk a lot about uh, that I think Christian Plummer mentioned on an earlier panel was uh, the experience of isolation, right? And you know, this is a predominantly white industry and every agency is predominantly white because there are only 5% black people in the agency. So that well, anything we can do to uh, help with that feeling of isolation uh, is what we should be doing as, as leaders and agencies. Um, so speaking of the roles that you guys juggle because you don't have any set hierarchy, um, how do you keep the machine that is, has become Black at Mullen going where you don't have assigned roles? Yeah. Yeah, Raquel. I can kind of start. I think that was very intentional, right? Like we wanted to make sure that there was no executive leadership to the group, no presidents, vice presidents, treasurers. And that kind of allowed us to come in and out of the space as needed. So if you think about this industry is very demanding and at any given point something could happen on a client or an account and we need to be pulled in and we're not able to give that same amount of time that we mm. may have wanted to. So in doing that, we were able to juggle the roles and allow other people to come in and take the reins and not having those executive positions then allow people to take on as much or as little as they wanted to. And I think Maya is a great example of that. Maya came in recently and has just like catapulted all of the boundaries that she's been able to do mm -hmm. or that have been put upon her. And I think she can speak a little bit more, but it's been amazing to see her grow into that. Yeah, so I, this being my first like big girl job, I was like, I wanna be <laughs> um, as active in it as possible. And Black and Mellon was the great I guess resource for me to like jump in to do that. So like Raquel was saying, like you get as involved as you want to be. And since and because I'm such like an entry level employee, I probably have the bandwidth and the time to do that where other people can't. So we actually spoke, a few of us actually spoke at Hub Week um, in Boston a few weeks ago, and I was just like, I didn't even really sign up for it. They were just like, oh, who can submit the application? I was like, oh, like I can do it. And then it kind of came time to like actually present. They're like, who can do it? And I was like, I mean, I guess I can, and so that's kind of how I <laughs> ended up here. And like, it's been a lot of fun though, because I feel like it's a great opportunity for all of us to kind of do things that aren't required in our day-to-day -day roles. So we're becoming like really diversified in the things that we're doing and can really be like impactful with the group. And I, it's a really great opportunity. So this group inside of Mullen Lowe has grown tremendously, and I'm so grateful to all of you for enabling that to happen. Um, Tama, what? What should people think about when they don't have those numbers, when they don't have the volume of people or funding, or what, what should they think about doing where they are? No, for sure. And um, I was coming from an agency where I was literally one of two black people in the whole entire agency. Um, it was a small shop, granted, but about 60 to 70 people, but I was still one of two. And I was the only black creative when I was there. Um, but one thing I realized about community, I mean, it's really all about how you define what community is. To me, community is a lot about support. Mm -hmm. And I realized that sometimes, you know, you may have to tap in to the entire community that extends outside the wall of advertising. So like, let's pretend you're in a place where there aren't any black people at all. You're in a shop in Jackson, Wyoming or something, right? 
You know, if there are other black folks in Wyoming or wherever you're at, you know, <laughs> feel free to tap into them. They may not necessarily work in advertising, uh, but they can still serve as a resource for you. And another thing that I've also been doing is like, me and a lot of my friends, you know, we're on various group chats where we sort of discuss our workplace racism issues. And one thing I realized that this has done for me is it's allowed me to cope with some of the stress that I, I experience at work. And I think sometimes we take for granted, we don't really fully comprehend like how much stress that is put upon us as black folks working in this industry, right? Mm -hmm. A lot of us feel underappreciated. A lot of us, you know, lack resources to even do things like black and mullen. So over a period of time, this stress can like really compound and like really just get to us, right? Mm -hmm. So always feel open to be sure to like, you know, reach out to other folks who may not even be in your city, in your agency, et cetera, and forge relationships with them to create community. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I would agree. I, I would recommend, and even though it may not be everyone's cup of tea, but um, applying yourself to different conferences, organizations, groups, whatever it may be, um, of people outside of your physical workplace, because you're more than likely going to meet people who are like-minded, you know, of color and or black, who are not only trying to secure the bag, but they also want to build that network mm -hmm. and have connections for people, whether they're looking to hire someone or if they need, you know, advice on a resume or a creative project. And I can speak from personal experience regarding MAPE, which is the Multicultural Advertising Intern Program. Woo -hoo, MAPE, yes, um, as well as Ad Color and Ad Color Future. Shout out, yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we love to see it. Um, but I, I would say those are great opportunities if you're looking and you may not have those numbers physically in your yeah. workplace. Yeah. Talk, talk more about that. Like, like we're all here at Here All the Black People. Uh, we sent a group of people to add color. You're a MAPE intern, we have other MAPE interns, but like, talk personally about what those experiences have meant for you and how they've helped you grow in your career. Absolutely, um, I would say, I'm gonna tell you what I'm gonna tell you, then I'm gonna tell you, and then I'm gonna tell you what I told you. So, <laughs> no, um, so as we know, MAPE, MAPE and Ad Color, I think, do a great job of telling me and reminding me that community is more than just people who look like you but it's people who have shared those experiences with you and see your value. And when it comes to Ad Color, it's an organization that champions um, diversity and excellence among creative industries. And what clicked for at least my class, um, from my personal perspective, is that we had a day where we shared a lot of our stories of feeling isolated in the industry, whether we felt devalued or felt overlooked or unseen or unheard. And the theme of that day was, we see you. Mm -hmm. And that clicked, and I was like, yes, I love a good metaphor, I love, I love deep stuff. But um, you know, we shared all these different experiences that we had, and although, ooh, although all of our stories kind of differed, they had a very similar theme, which was, we don't feel heard, or we don't always feel seen. Mm -hmm. um, and it kind of just took that moment for us to be like, okay, got it. And for the rest of that week, you would have sworn that we knew each other for like 10 years. We met within two days of each other. Mm -hmm. So I think it's just a reminder that like your community is a bunch of people that not just look like you, but they acknowledge you, they see you, and they do whatever it takes to make sure that you understand your value, mm -hmm. but that your coworkers do as well. Because mm -hmm. sometimes people like to pick and choose the value that you have. So that's what Ad Color and Mape has taught me right. so far. Um, another thing that I have witnessed the team getting from each other um, is uh, that it's like, it's enough to come to work and try to do your job every day, right? Like all of you have incredible busy jobs and I, we expect a lot of you. But on top of doing those jobs, uh, you also have to sort of hold the mantle, explain things, be the black person that explains something. Um, Maya, you talk about sort of like being that person, no, I don't wanna talk about you can't touch my hair, right? Like there's so many things that you have to do on top of doing your job that I, what I think, what I observe you guys getting out of the community of Black at Mellon is a place to just be like, you know, like, um, and you know, that's like one of the many reasons I'm happy that you have the community there to, to support that, right? And I, lo I love that, what you said. Maya, um, so you came to Mullen Low in part because of a mentor reference and in part because we went to Hampton. Woo woo. Um, and I think that's how, it, isn't that the whole name of the school, Hampton woo woo? Because every time you say Hampton, you also say woo woo. Yes. So just, I think that's the name of the school. Um, and just like the idea of feeling supported and heard, as, as Taylor was just saying, is so important for professional mm -hmm. growth. Um, talk about... Uh, what leaders are doing to support your experience as an entry-level employee. Right, so we've all 
talked about how great Black and Mellon is, especially for someone coming in new to the industry, it's been a great resource for me. Um, but supportive management is equally as important, and I feel like having supportive managers and supervisors is like crucial to like anybody's career to really grow professionally. And so I am really lucky that my day-to-day -day supervisor has been very like supportive of me from day one. So we have weekly one-on-one -on -one chats, and she's like, "Okay, Maya's like, how are you adjusting to Mullen and like our client work?" And then she'll say, "How are you adjusting to Boston?" Because I'm came here all by myself. Like I knew a few people, but it's, it's still a big adjustment. And then she's like, so how are you adjusting overall? Because to me, she like genuinely cares about my overall like success and how, and how my success will translate to my work. Um, and I really, really appreciate that about her because I definitely have supervisors who are a little bit more dismissive or don't, not that they don't care, but it, it doesn't have like the same, I guess, intention behind it. Um, and I think like for anybody in here who is a supervisor to entry level employees, I think it's just important to kind of reach back and just see how they're doing, especially for these new level, new employees of color, or black employees especially, because everyone was new once, um, and there are things that we just don't know coming in, so having someone who like genuinely cares and wants to see you succeed and will cultivate that is like really, really important, Like, and I appreciate it so much, and then once again, like just having this group, I can talk to other people in the different departments, be like, hey guys, like I have a question about this, and so, mm -hmm. yeah, I just think it's really important for to, for people in, at any level to really have that supervisor, that manager that is willing to reach back and pull you forward. So, oh, sorry. sorry. Um, so one of the things that I asked you guys when we were preparing was what's the, what's the one word or words that comes to mind when you think about Black at Mullen? Do you wanna share what it is quickly with? Sure, um, no, uh, I would say it's a sigh of relief. Sigh of relief for, for you. Mm -hmm. Safe for me. Yeah. Empowering. Yeah. Community. Yeah. Um, beautiful. All of those answers are beautiful. Thank you. I think safety is the, is the pillar or one of the pillars that Black at Mullen was created around, right? That like you, Raquel, and Tamani recognizing a couple of others and sort of joining up and then realizing like, wow, we have something here. Let's name it something. Let's see if we can get funding. Let's uh, and often when people ask me, like, what is Black at Mullen, I say they're the team that leads me in what I do. Um, so talk about um, how you guys handle other coworkers, white coworkers, who want to be a part of the group. Because now that you have mass and size and energy, uh, other people want to be a part of it. They want to feed off it. Like El Pueblo was born, great. Now we have a Latina group and Ace, the Asian group, great. And Phoenix, the LGBT, and all of them have their own identity and their strength and their growth. Uh, so how do you handle someone who wants to join the group? And what is, what is your individual? Everybody's going to tell you their individual opinion. Oh no, definitely. Um, it's funny because, you know, for me, it's like when I analyze that question, like I even look back at my time in undergrad, and, you know, when you, when you think about minority groups, right, like groups that are geared towards minority, mm -hmm. the burden of inclusivity, allowing for other people who are non-black to be able to take, partake and participate in your group, that burden usually falls on a black group, right? Mm -hmm. When I was an undergrad, we had a group called the Black Student Alliance, right? But we had people that were... Asian, Hispanic, et cetera, who didn't identify as black, they were part of the groups. But you know, you couldn't go to like the Asian Student Alliance and see black folks in there, right? right. You know, and so, so I've always noticed that sort of trend in my, my life, and one thing I've, I've realized is that when it comes for black, to black folks, being able to just sort of sit together in a room and have a really serious, critical discussion about the problems that we face as a people, a lot of the times, if there are people in the, in the room that aren't black, mm -hmm. the conversation can become a little bit mum over time, right? Because people are going to start thinking about, oh, man, I don't want to say the wrong thing to offend somebody. Uh, oh, man, this white person is here. They might run back and tell, uh, you know, my boss that I'm saying this in the meeting. So a lot of the times the dialogue gets a little messed up. Mm -hmm. You know, so from just based off of that experience alone, I've always found it to be the most constructive, especially for talking critically for black folks to have a space where they can talk about these issues by themselves. Um, so it's, it's just one of those things where it's like everybody's different, everybody kind of adjusts to that in their own way, um, but I definitely think it allows for us to just achieve more because I'm one of those people who are of the volition that there isn't a single goal 
that black folks cannot achieve on their own, right. regardless of the scope of it. Like right. even if it's something like a HR issue, a hiring mm -hmm. initiative, uh, a workplace racism mm -hmm. issue, so long as we're able to get on code, get on the same page as a people, there's really nothing we can't do. Uh, mm -hmm. So that's just my little take on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I feel like I can jump in after that. I 100% agree with Tomo. Um, I think on top of that, what we've been able to accomplish, and I think what most groups like this look to do is like base it off of a goal. Mm -hmm. So I think that there are instances where we'll have an inclusive goal for that group, whether that's educating on Black History Month or educating on Alvin Ailey or whatever may have you that is looking to include not only this group but the rest of the agency right. or community of Boston. But then there are times where we're looking to be specifically exclusive, mm -hmm. right? Like our, our weekly meetings that we have where we get together, hang out, shoot the shit, like those are for us, as well as our monthly lunches. Mm -hmm. Like we get together to tell our, our good moments and our bad moments. Mm -hmm. We don't want that space to be impeded, so we do ex exclusively use that space for us. Mm -hmm. So it kind of depends, and I think that there is room for both, depending on if, what your priority is. Mm -hmm. Objectives are always a, a, a key thing to like hone in on, and I think when it comes to inclusivity versus exclusivity, like what are the objectives of that individual mm -hmm. that wants to join the group? Mm -hmm. Because oftentimes in culture, we've seen black people will create a meme, a trend, a dance, a saying, a phrase, whatever it is, and people want to hop on. Like that, it it, it happens. Um, but sometimes I think we have to remember like. Black at Mullen was created out of necessity. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not just like a trend, something cool, something right. fun. Even though we do Kiki and it's great. Um, <laughs> you know, we still have other initiatives that, are, that we want to make an impact and have outcomes. Right. And sometimes it comes down to a question of, do you want access to something that you think is cool? Or is this an actual thing that, that matters to you? Is equity mm -hmm. in the workplace something that matters and that you want to be a part of at this organization? Right. Well said. I th you know, recently we brought Demaine Davis in. Uh, she's a, a director and copywriter, and Ava DuVernay, film director, and I brought her in to talk to the Black and Mullen group, and she, she told them that when Demaine and I started, there were two black people at the agency, Demaine and the janitor, and when she heard that we had a group called Black and Mullen, she wanted to come and meet them. Uh, and this conversation of inclusivity and exclusivity came up when we were uh, talking to Demaine, and I just said, um, like, wait, like, you guys have full permission to be exclusive. Um, and I didn't realize that I had to say that. So, like, for me, like, every time I'm with this group, I learn, like, okay, there's one more thing I need to say out loud so that the rest of the agency understands not only where I stand and what I'm expecting of them, but what I expect of everybody at the agency. Uh, and so I do, I do want you to have that safe space and be exclusive, and you do do a lot for the agency that is also inclusive, like hosting... Black History Month, uh, bringing in outside speakers to, to, to the agency. So I think you do provide those opportunities for other people, but in terms of their group, like I'm all right with exclusivity. Um, so, but we're in the business of creative. We're an agency, we're in the business of creative, and creative is an economic multiplier. It's the lifeblood of a lot of what we do. Um, so I'd love you guys to talk about whether or not you think it's your role or responsibility to be the police of creativity when either creativity is or isn't featuring someone who's black, uh, black creativity, like how are you feeling about, about that? Oh, no, no, I could definitely jump in. Um, I know for me, a lot of this has to do with just establishing a personal principle of black self-respect as a black person. Um, because we go through a lot, um, mm -hmm. whether we're even commuting to work, something might pop off on the train, whether mm -hmm. you're walking to work, Something could pop off on your, on, the, on your walk to work. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, when you're in the actual office, you're dealing with constant microaggressions. Sometimes it's subtle, sometimes it's deliberate. You know, the list goes on. Um, so for me, it's always been one of those things where policing black creativity, which to me, I interpret that as, you know, analyzing a campaign, analyzing a brief, and making sure that black people are represented in the most constructive way possible, mm -hmm. in a way that empowers us, uh, in a way that shows us in a positive light. To me, that's something that's extremely important to do, uh, but it's also something that takes a lot of courage, and I think it's something that you almost have to practice. Mm -hmm. um, you shouldn't necessarily wait till concepting for you to start feeling like you want to police you know, black creativity, right? You know, it can be something where if you see a black person being mistreated in the office, you know, and that person may not necessarily have 
the fortitude or the resources to stand up for themselves, you know, that's your brother, that's your sister, mm -hmm. you know, it's okay for you to go ahead and comfort them and console them and stand up for them, right? Mm -hmm. So that way when you do go into concepting, you know, it's easy for you to go ahead and just be like, you know what, I'm not feeling that. Um, here's a more constructive approach. And if you're ever unsure about, you know, what to do, like, okay, I'm looking at this brief, I don't really know if it's, if it's racist or not, like, always understand that you have people around you that can give you constructive advice. And that's one of the benefits of Black and Mullen again. It's like if I was ever to encounter something like that and I was confused about it, I could just run back to my contemporaries and they would give me great mm -hmm. feedback on it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think what's crucial about what Tomo just said is we've done that multiple times. Um, it's, there have been instances where we felt <clears throat> unable to speak on behalf of the entire black community, mm -hmm. right? Because I, I can't go into a room and speak for all black women. I, I like, I'm, we're not a monolith. So pulling in each other to say, okay guys, this came up in a room. How do you feel? Um, how should we move forward? How do you think that I should project the next steps is helpful for all of us so we don't feel like we're alone. Mm -hmm. And I think for me, like policing black creativity is, it, fe it feels like an obligation sometimes, but it's an obligation that I like to take on personally just because there are so many instances where we're in rooms where we're not able to, where we don't exist, mm -hmm. where we're not even present, right? So the, the, the opportunity isn't even there. But if I'm in a room, if I have that opportunity, I should say something. Mm -hmm. And so I always take it upon myself to integrate that into my role, even though it technically I shouldn't have to. It's something that I feel passionately because what if nobody was there? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and just kind of following up on everything that they said, like obviously if something, you see something and it doesn't stay right in your spirit, absolutely speak up because mm -hmm. there's no worse feeling than seeing something like come to life and they're like, dang, I should have done something about that. Um, but then, and this is my personal opinion, at the same time, there are some things that like will happen and like everyone said, like something like a little sus, you're like, I don't know if that's racist or I don't know if that's bad and like it doesn't really like offend me. Like, I, I think it can be a little frustrating when the onus is just on us to be that voice in the room. And sometimes I feel like if it's not something that's so like, it doesn't, I don't know, it, it doesn't bother you as much. Sometimes I feel like, and I don't know if this is bad or not to say, but like I feel like it's not necessarily your job to speak up, especially like sometimes feigned outrage can be counterproductive because I mean, if you are quote unquote mad at something but don't really know why you're mad at it or why it's wrong, then it's not necessarily productive to like say anything, but that's just like my opinion. All right, so I just want to pause and say, if I had this much poise at their age, like <laughs> I would be running for president of the United States. Um, you guys are all like incredible. Um, and uh, just to add to that too, um, real quick, it's okay for you to stand up for yourself as yes. a black person, even within a corporate setting, right? Even within the, your job. And I think sometimes we lose sight of that. Like, if, let, a, let another black person disrespect you on the street or on the bus, you're gonna pop off on them, right? Or let, let another black person even disrespect you in the office, you're gonna pull them aside and let them know that that wasn't cool. Mm -hmm. But a lot of the times, you know, as black folks, we, sometimes we fear backlash, we fear retribution to the point where even if one of our white colleagues disrespects us, mm -hmm. it's like we just try to like sweep it underneath the rug and act like nothing happened. It's like, I don't, me personally, I don't care if you a junior or if you're an ECD, you're not gonna disrespect me. If Donald Trump, who's the president of this country, can't disrespect me, you can't disrespect me. Mm -hmm. So always maintain a high level of black self-respect. It's something that I feel like is important. It's something that I feel like is gonna take us a long way and it'll definitely help in the long run in terms of you dealing with the, the amount of stress that you experience at work. So we got the five minutes and then we're gonna open it up to audience questions. Um, Raquel, can you talk about sort of like the learning curve mm -hmm. of Black at Mullen and, you know, cause we've talked a lot about the successes that You've had, uh, yeah. but like, what have you done wrong that you wish you did differently, or, or what's something you can share so that somebody else doesn't make that same mistake? Yeah, I, I like to not think about the things that we've done wrong <laughs> as mistakes. Uh, maybe just yep, lessons, learning you know? opportunities. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I think there are a couple of things that we've definitely um, grown from over the last year and a half. I'd say first was understanding that we could be social, we could be familial, but still be professional. Yes. Um, there was a point in which we were 
talking about everything but work in our monthly lunches and our, our weekly touch bases, but then it came to our attention of, well, what if we use this time to help each other negotiate salaries? Mm -hmm. What if we use this time to talk about client work and if you wanna work on a different account, mm -hmm. how I can move and make that shift? And so it kind of became a lesson for us of, mm -hmm. oh, we can do a lot here. Um, so like that, that was really a crucial for us. And then on top of that, I'd, I'd really say, I feel like we feel like we've accomplished so much, right, with the growth, mm -hmm. but there's a time when we now have to take a step back and realize there's so much more we can do. Mm -hmm. And so not feeling like we've just, you know, finished it and say, oh, this is amazing, where like there's still work to be done. Mm -hmm. Can we go to, so we started at the beginning, I'm skipping a question just because of time, but I'm, I'm gonna start with you, Taylor. Like. Uh, at the beginning, we talked about the impact that it has right now. Mm -hmm. um, and we're, I personally, we are doing everything we can to retain all of the people that we've recruited. Mm -hmm. um, but if one of you leaves, like, what do you hope the legacy that you leave behind, or what do you hope the impact oh, is that remains at Black and Mullen? Absolutely. I think, in a word, validation. I think as a black professional, um, a lot of times you may feel overlooked or you may feel like, oh, was that right of me to say? Should I have said that? Should I think that? Like the stress and the emotion and the challenges and the thoughts and the um, anxiety sometimes that occurs, like it's real. And sometimes I just need another person to say like, okay, I'm not tripping, right? Is it me? Like right. that, was, that was whack for her to say, right? Yeah. Um, and I think a lot of times as black professionals, we have to often choose between our peace and our paycheck. And a lot of times you're gonna choose the paycheck because that's life, but I think because having a group of community or people who support you and value you, when you have to make, the, make time for those harder conversations, mm -hmm. it helps every, every which way to have people say like, no, we understand where you're coming from and whatever choice you make, we, we support you. So validation is most Love important. That. Um, for me, I guess I think the one impact that I really want Black at Mullen to have is I want, we understand why it's important, but I want the agency to understand and to get it. And I know that's like a lot to ask of people who, don't, who may not want to get it, um, and but I just feel like it, that's something that's just so important to me. Like I want people to like you know know why touching my hair and like asking me why I change my hairstyle is not okay to say in the workplace, or understanding like why why this space is so important and why we need something like this. And like I said, this is something like you can't teach people, you can't make people learn what you want them to learn. But I just want people to kind of understand it and see the importance and the value of a group like this. Mm -hmm. For me, I, I have two things I'd love the impact to be. I think the first one is to continue for this group to be for us and by us. Mm -hmm. um, I think what makes us, well, we, why we like to say it's not an ERG, is really because it, we created it with, for us in mind. Mm -hmm. It was not created by the corporation, by the agency, so we're able to say, yes, we wanna do this, no, we don't wanna do that, yes, we'll do what we want, but with the exception of, of thinking about how can we make the agency better at the same time. Mm -hmm. So it, it gives us that freedom. And I'd love to, for, the, for the group to have that moving forward mm -hmm. always. But then the second impact I'd love for the group to make is figuring out how to, to recruit and maintain senior leadership yes. of color. I think that that's so crucial if you think about three of us on this stage are the most senior level people in our departments. And so it's difficult for us to see ourselves in higher positions right. because it doesn't exist at our agency currently. So I, I, I think we talk a lot about how we can make this group better, but in terms of like having people in the room, at the C-suite, mm -hmm. at the director level, mm -hmm. that's so crucial for all of us because then it allows us to grow and have something to look forward to and have a blueprint for how to get there. Mm -hmm. And just to respond to something you said, like anything you guys do that makes Black at Mullen better makes the agency better. Like, so like being a little bit selfish about the things that you wanna do, the effect of it will be to make the entire agency better. Tama. No, definitely. Um, I think for me, the impact that I want from Black and Mullen is really the impact that I want from every black person in, in, in advertising, every black person in this industry. And that's for us to really t start taking a real serious approach in ingratiating ourselves with the black businesses in our respective communities, right? Mm -hmm. We already we understand the statistics surrounding black-owned businesses. We also understand the impact of what black, the success of black-owned businesses does for our people and our community at large. And we have some of the most talented people in advertising in this room right now. Mm -hmm. And it's like, you know, we live in neighborhoods, whether it's Bed-Stuy, whether it's Dorchester, where we have these businesses that are in need of creative assistance. And we have folks here that are strategists, uh, account folks, art directors, uh, copywriters, you name it. We possess a skill set that is very valuable for our people. 
So, you know, it, it's my dream, it's my passion that, you know, we just really start hitting the ground running, start tapping into mm -hmm. the communities that we're part of, and just really start, start working as one to just build each other up and empower our people. Mm -hmm. Are there any questions for this amazing group of talent? Yeah, right here in the front. Hi, my name is Ashley, and I'm a designer and animator um, at an agency in Dallas, tiny agency. Um, with that being said, there's 20 people in the agency, and I was the only black person in the agency. And I walked in one day, and there was a black guy sitting at the desk, and I was like, like hey. Like, hey. Um, so they, well, the higher-ups in the agency have noticed that we talk. Like, we are always together. We are always, like, talking and stuff. But they have looked at it as a negative thing. Hmm. Um, like we're clicking up, mm -hmm. <laughs> which I don't mm -hmm. think is fair because there was clicks before I got there. There was stuff that was already like set in place. But how do you handle like when leadership is not viewing you finding someone you can relate to as a positive thing, mm -hmm. but they're more so seeing it as like a negative thing and like you're like separating yourself from the rest of the, of the agency and the group? Mm -hmm. um, Great no, question. I, I can answer that. Um, you know, honestly, that's always going to be a problem that, you know, black folks are going to experience in general, you know, whether it's Three, where there's you and your homeboys on the street just chilling, you know, any group of black folks that are just congregating in one is always a problem, right? People are always curious to know what's going on. Um, so for me personally, like, I try not to even, like, care about what people think. You know, so long as I'm productive and doing my work, doing my job, taking care of business, you know, then I'm happy, right? People are always going to feel some type of way about black people congregating together amongst ourselves especially if you're doing something constructive, right? So don't let that get to you. Don't let that stop you from creating a relationship uh, with another black person in your agency and just keep doing what you're doing. Is it an opportunity also for you to have a conversation about why, are we gonna say that, Taylor? Sorry, oh, you no, go then. Fine. You I was go. gonna say, ask why they think it's such mm -hmm. a negative. Make them answer the question. Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. like, oh, well, it's a disturbance. Why is it a disturbance? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, but those questions are hard to ask and it's mm -hmm. a lot of pressure. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but sometimes I think people can be very like, passive aggressive in terms of why they view certain conversations in the workplace or people hanging out together. But if you um, are able to foster that conversation and kind of lead them to the answer that they're trying to say without saying, it might kind of help them view what they're thinking as whack. <laughs> and or give them the book, Why Are All the Black Kids Sitting at the Lunch Table Together? That's that a great book. Um, yeah. And it will be very helpful. <laughs> but I'm sorry that happens. That's, yeah, that's, that's trash. Yeah, sorry. Sorry. Yes. Hi. Oh, that was really loud. Okay, um, so I work in Richmond, so I feel this is very relatable. You touched on Black and Mullen impacting the Boston community. Can you talk about what more, what that looks like? Yeah, so. That was one of the questions we didn't get to. <laughs> Excellent job. So yeah, um, I can touch on it a Great. little bit. But um, so when the group kind of started, I think someone posted a picture like on Twitter or Instagram and like it was Black and Mullen. And so someone who was like a connection to someone in the group was like, wow, that's amazing that you guys have that and went on to actually create Black and Blended at Hill Holiday. And yeah. yeah. And so um, because of, I guess, our existence and the noise that we're making, um, other groups, especially within Boston, are kind of are forming now. So I think uh, last two weeks ago, we had like a mixer with the black folks at Hill Holiday, Digitas, what was Arnold, the other? Arnold, Arnold. Yeah, so I think people are kind of starting to see what we're doing and see that like, oh wow, we can have this at our agency. This is something that we want to create and I think that's something great that Black and Mullen has mm -hmm. inspired other people to do. Mm -hmm. And I think on, on top of that, I know for Black History Month last year, what we made an initiative to do was to make sure we were sourcing all of the food for the office for that month from black owned businesses, from black owned restaurants. So making an effort to, to pull in the community where we can um, and then kind of make it a mandate for the rest of the agency to do so, right? It's like, right. here's a list of all, the, you say that there aren't any here, we're giving it to you, so you have no excuse. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and then like allowing people to then say, oh, this was amazing, we should continue to order from there. Right. And we like to see that that continue over past Black History Month. Right, I mean, that's why like somebody says, well, what's your role? And I'm like, my role is to shut up and listen. Like when they came to me and said, I want to do only black owned caterers for Black History Month, and I made it a mandate, and like I threw a shit fit every time. <laughs> the first three days I walked in and there was like the same cheese and crackers from the same. Uh, so I think you do have to get leadership involved um, just to make sure they have the support they need to do the things they want to do. But did you have a, yeah. 
Hi. Um, I am a director of talent and diversity for my agency in Philadelphia. And part of my role is not only to bring in new talent, but to retain it. Yes. So uh, my question for the panel is, uh, how have you, um, what's your experience in terms of retention uh, since the inception of this community that you've developed? And I love it, by the way, and want to copy it, so. Copy it, <laughs> copy it, copy it. <laughs> Um, I could kind of start. So I think that's a huge part of what this group is, is, is supposed to do, is to not only bring in talent, but retain it. Um, and I know we're not supposed to talk in percentages, you can go ahead. but <laughs> um, I believe our current number as to about a month ago was 93% uh, retention rate among black employees. So something is working. Um, and I think that we, t we talk a lot about diversity and inclusion and in that we see diversity as bodies. Inclusion is about culture. Mm -hmm. So taking it one step further to foster community with each other, but also the agency so people feel like they have a place so that they're not looking to move. Like anytime somebody comes to the group and they're like, hey guys, I'm not really feeling this client, I'm not really feeling the, the room, we kind of pull them aside and say, okay, how can we help? How can we switch accounts? How can we shift your position here so that you stay within the agency even if you're not happy in that specific role? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What I love about what they do for each other is that they don't confirm things. Instead, they like hold up the mirror and allow like, you know, like what you've done for people that aren't happy in their job and uh, to find another job or to, you know, like you're like validating their experience and then helping them find a new place. Yes. Hi. Um, I am from the 60 i I'm an art director, and we started our own um, ERG called Being. Great. So we just wanted to know how you guys um, help the black community outside of your agency? Like, how do you help them get into your agency or like just in the community in general? Mm -hmm. um, so I can talk about getting people in. So one thing that I love about Mullen or Black at Mullen is what they've done is a lot of recruitment trips to colleges. So we've gone to local schools, but they've also made a really big effort to go to HBCUs. Um, woo, yes. And so that's something that really speaks to me. And I was talking about this earlier today is that Black students at HBCUs don't know jobs like, like they do, but they don't really know that jobs like these exist and how they can get involved. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's really important for us to kind of go back and do like a tour and be like, hey guys, like there are black people here, you can be successful here, and we want you here. Mm -hmm. um, so and we've done that again. So we went to Hampton. I think we're going to like v well, um, VCU maybe? I don't know. We're, we, yeah, so we're, go we're, we're going to extend and like go back and give back to the community and to other schools. I, I think yeah. you went recently with went to UMass. To UMass, the, uh, yeah. yeah. The other things that we've done is um, there's, a, there's an organization in Boston called Artists for Humanity that is a, a, a program that pays uh, students in Boston who have lost their arts in the school. It pays them to come to an after school program because uh, for a lot of black students, uh, if there isn't a paid internship or a paid way to learn about the arts, that's not what they're going to do. And so Artists for Humanity pays for students to learn about uh, art and pays them for their art. And so that is like our top sort of um, uh, uh, community group that we partner with. We, we just recently did some, some work with them. We have all our parties at their facility and that helps fund them. And the other thing we did was uh, 2540. Does anyone else want to talk about 2540? Sure. Yeah, um, 2540 happened a little bit before my time, but it was an initiative where um, they kind of partnered with high schoolers who weren't really sure what advertising were, but saw it as a potential field for them to get into as creatives. So you, we had these really amazing spoken word artists that put together these pieces of work that they created and that just worked with us as like this um, kind of directional agency and mentors so mm -hmm. that we could help them create these pieces of work. And I believe those pieces of work are eventually gonna live somewhere like on yeah, our site. Yep. But um, they, they were magnificent. One talked about black hair and the other talked about police brutality. And it was really powerful that these high schoolers, mm -hmm. I think they were like 16 and 17, mm -hmm. could get on camera and then just, just let it all out. Mm -hmm. But then also to make them such beautiful pieces of art right. um, to put out into the world. They created an album called um, A, A Seat, Seat at, at Our Table. table. Yeah. And they, the students from the Boston Arts Academy did all of it. They wrote it, they composed the music, they shot it, they directed it, and then they created an album called A Seat at Our Table that's available online on iTunes. Um, Nightstick is the one about police brutality, and I'm sorry, I can't remember the one about hair, but there's a whole album. 
And just, and, and just to add on that really quickly, because I know I talked about this before as well, um, but I feel like part of being able to sort of add value um, into the career in advertising, uh, particularly with black folks who may be a little bit unfamiliar with what advertising really is, um, other than, of course, recruiting them and reaching out to them, of course, is just really making a powerful statement within the community by empowering the community. Um, so again, like I know I said it before, but it, like, it, it really is our duty and our purpose as black folks who possess this creative gift to really tap into the businesses in our community. Um, I, I can't stress that enough. I, I definitely think it's something that our people are really longing for. Mm -hmm. um, it's definitely something that has the potential to shape not only how we view the businesses in our community, but also ourselves as well. Mm -hmm. It gives us perspective, it gives us purpose, it allows us to understand that, yo, we can like build something from the ground up, mm -hmm. work together as a people, and sustain something long term. You know, so it, it's definitely one of those things. There's a variety of ways that we can tackle these things. Um, it's something that I'm really passionate about. I definitely want to see Black and Mullen really start hitting the pavement super hard, mm -hmm. even harder than we've ever hit before. And hopefully it trickles down to everybody else and we all just get on code and just start really right. taking it back, so. But yes, <laughs> yes, Tom.